Good afternoon and welcome to HR Boost's wonderful real conversation culture chat of the culture haves and the culture nots. And we're welcoming Ted Garnett today, one of the culture experts that I get to commiserate with and participate with as we have PS Culture Matters as a strategic alliance partner. How are you doing today, Ted? I'm good, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. How are things in Iowa today? You know, it is overcast, but hey, everyone's happy it's summer, so no complaints. Right? <laughs> well, it's one of those things where I just came off a of Best and Brightest National Board call, so I'm fresh off of another Zoom presentation, but I really wanted to connect with you so that people could just observe you and I like a fly on the wall and eavesdrop between two culture experts and what we're, you know, hearing, seeing, and reflecting upon, and there's probably so much happening right now still based on the fact that even right now in Chicago, they're rolling back the reopening. I saw that on the news this morning. And so, you know, the roller coaster continues with everything that's going on with the pandemic. And I know that you're feeling that too in the Great Corridor back there in Iowa, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, I think it's a unique time that we're in, in one regard, but at the same time, um, times of pressure or change or turmoil or, you know, chaos, stress, whatever, those, those are the perfect time to measure, look at, and improve your culture because this is the time where it really needs to perform. It, this is the time when it can either shine, right, the halves, or it can kind of fall flat and you're going to be, you know, trying to recover while everyone else is accelerating out of the corner, right? You're, you're going to be trying to figure out how to take the corner. So this kind of uniqueness from a pandemic standpoint unique, but from a pressure standpoint in business, like you just said, those roller coasters happen, whether it's, I don't know, we had the fifth worst natural disaster in the history of the country in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 2008. So we're just now getting over that. And now a pandemic hits, you know, like every 10 years, it's something, <laughs> something's yeah. coming. Absolutely. Well, and it's one of those things where I completely agree with you because even with my own team, you know, we've been committed to culture, as you know, and I felt ever since, you know, March, when things really started to hit the fan here in Chicagoland, um, I, as a business owner, I took on more of that CEO leadership thought reaction to business as I'm taking calls from my clients and they're going on pause and some businesses dissolve right before our eyes and rather than my HR head, right? Yep. And so immediately I felt that the vibration of what happens, right? Oh no, we have to protect business. We're trying to protect people's jobs. And so it becomes that immediate response of stress on the individual level, which happens with everyone. And I'm just being transparent about mine, which was it becomes more myopic. And it's all about surviving and protecting your family and the people closest to you first. And so I was open with my own team about that. And as much as they say you should have all town hall meetings, and you and I are fans of that, I knew that I have a virtual team. I've been running a virtual business with embedded talent and other people's employed opportunity business environments for 10 years. 10 year anniversary for HR Boost this month, Ted, right? So what's crazy is I sat there and I said, I can't believe this. I'm going to have to send an email so that it touch, touches every booster at the same time because there's no way I can get them all in a meeting right now, when, right before the state went on lockdown. And I just poured my heart and soul into that email and let them know things, you know, about how I was feeling and what we have to do and how I feel about them and, you know, making that psychological safety within my culture so that they could see everything that I was considering. And I shared numbers, the financials, what was in the pipeline, what we're losing, et cetera. I was transparent. In addition to the fact, Ted, that I, I asked for help, which some leaders have a hard time doing. I immediately asked for help from my own team, which was, I'm clearly not going to be the fun booster, so to speak. I'm right. I'm going to be serious about everyone knows who knows me knows I'm fun. I and can't believe that. I cannot believe that. That's <laughs> false, right? Like, well, I it, can't believe you even had that conversation. I can't even imagine that. But yeah, but clearly you had to triage, right? You had to yes. figure out how to, yes. you know, at some point, if there's no business, right, you can be all about the HR boost mission. And you, I know you are, Nicole, and I know your boosters are, but no margin, no mission. If we can't That's run right. a business, then we're all disemployed. Because all of my team are HR professionals, seasoned HR practitioners. And so they were all in triage, as I call it, for our clients. Immediate furloughs, immediate layoffs, you know, plus the voice, the, the strategic communication. And what's interesting is I found 
de pure delight, which deepened our culture at HR Boost. And I just got news that we're one of Chicago's best and brightest companies to work for from best and brightest companies to work for. So we deepened our culture during the last yes. 120 days, which is just an epiphany of uniqueness that I share openly with everyone, which was I really did have that, I guess, psychological safety in my own culture so that we could really have crucial conversations, real conversations immediately, even if it was on the phone, in email, or in these one-to-one -one type of Zoom kind of formats, even though, Ted, between you and me, huh, I'm Zoomed out, right? Same. This doesn't replace the human interaction. It never will. Hearing that, hearing that from clients all over the world that they're just, you know, uh, it, it gives us new appreciation for that saying better than nothing, which is a horribly low standard. But yeah, Zoom calls are better than nothing, but that's definitely, nobody wants that to be the new normal. And, and so we're just, we're dealing with it, but I've heard Zoom fatigue over and over. So, right. I mean, even us doing this real talk, I wish I was there with you, right? You know, it's just one more Zoom call meeting for people to watch or to attend or whatever. So, you know, credit to those people who are willing to consume more content to get better because you really hit the nail on the head on a couple of things. It's almost as if we planned this, which we did not, but right. you know, you, you hit lighting. the nail on the head. What we're seeing is the best leaders are going to come out of this really kind of miles ahead almost opportunistically. And that's not to make light of the seriousness. I mean, people are losing family members. People are going through divorces because of this. People can't yeah. attend a funeral. People can't go to a wedding. People can't see the birth of a grandchild. I mean, it's serious stress, not making light of that. We're but all grieving. I kinda, yeah, We're all there's, grieving there's, something. I think whether you're affected by COVID, by the illness itself or not, every single person is grieving in some form or fashion. And that's something all of us can relate to, I'm sure, because we're all grieving. But how do we bring that into the context of our workplaces, our culture conversations within companies, and getting that conversation where it's, like I said, psychologically safe? Because some people went home and they were sent home and they didn't have that culture that you and I are talking about before they were sent home remote. And so as a result, that it makes it harder to facilitate a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation, a crucial conversation, whether it be the C-suite or the independent, you know, operational leaders throughout the organization that have to touch their teams digitally or otherwise and communicate, if they didn't have that psychological safety, that is the silver lining right now is to just strip it down and maybe reach out as a real human being to somebody and forget talking about business for a second as is, or the objectives and tasks as they should be right now, but really connect on that one-to-one -one ability and level in a real humanistic way. And that's the silver lining I feel for professional environments, but let's talk about manufacturing environments. I mean, everybody isn't just, um, you know, on a remote basis right now. We have essential workers that have been hard hitting since the beginning. And even though more people are going remote across their organizations, um, we need that basically sense of connectedness and belongingness. I think it's ever more important on an, at an intimate space level, even with people we work with. What would you recommend immediately if somebody hasn't had the culture, doesn't believe in what you and I have been doing, right? Which is culture surveys consistently at Culture Voice, getting the anonymous voice of the people, having a structure for that, um, which my clients have because we include PS Culture Matters, GAPM, et cetera, in our HR services. It's, it's part of the benefit of being an HR Boost client. But I think there's a number of businesses that maybe are new to you or new to me, have never taken a culture survey or maybe even worse, they took a survey once and then they never told their people what they did about it, which I even have a client that faced that recently. But guess what? That's still an opportunity, which is to own it. So what would you say to them right there at the forefront if culture is like a whole new thing and they have to bridge and strip down that veneer and get into a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation with somebody that they're trying to bridge with, but they, they know that they didn't do it before? Well, I, I think you you kind of hit the nail on the head twice already. And so <laughs> if, I was, if I was taking notes, this would be a couple things I'd write down, you know? Okay. And the first, thing, the first thing I do is you don't have to have measured your culture and put the rigor in that you use with your clients and that we use with GAPM and ACM. You don't have to do that to start. That's the good news is you can hit the easy button, right? at a more global cultural perspective by just learning from what we already know or what we've learned from. So by, by being on the call today, I'm going to give you some of that. And anybody could start with this, right? And, and this is the global perspective goes something like this. 
and you hit the nail on the head on this already. I'm going to break it down to how we've seen it play out. Everybody's in a storm right now. The interesting thing is, as a manager, as a CEO, as an owner, what your perspective of the storm is, it might be different from you to your staff. And in your staff, person A on your manufacturing team, B and C, are having a different storm. Person A might just be having a little rain shower. In fact, it might be an opportunity for them to have kids back from college that they thought they were never going to see very much anymore. And so they're in, they're, their storm is a little bit of um, refreshing storm, right? It's a it's a rain shower. It's it's um, uh, they have a spouse who's working from home and is maybe still being paid their full rate and hasn't lost any employment and their income hasn't changed and in, in fact it's increased because they got a stimulus check and you know, so they're like, hey, this is you know yeah it's it's kind of like you said I'm grieving. I feel stress for my high school senior who didn't get to have graduation, but that's their level of stress and it's kind of a rain shower. There's almost as many positives as negatives for the, those people on your team, okay? In the middle, we kind of have people who are in a bit of a tumult, right? The, the ship's rocking. I mean, they, they, they may have lost a job or been furloughed. They may have a spouse who's been furloughed and now they're having to pay the bills with their one income and their spouse's unemployment is running out or being changed. And they're in a rocky scenario. This is not like fun time, like, oh, I get more family time with my kids at home. This is like, this is how am I gonna pay the bills? Can, can I keep my mortgage? They're stressed, that's a storm, okay? And then there's another group of people who this has impacted them to the point of a hurricane. I mean, they have lost a loved one. They have lost their job. They have friends in their, in their immediate circle, in their neighborhood, in their families, in their kids, whatever, who are sick in the hospital that they can't go see, or they, you know, it is a nightmare of a storm. It is a hurricane. And these three different people, all experiencing the storm differently, are all in your culture. There's a couple over here, a couple, maybe even all in the same cell group or same manufacturing sub team, right? They're all on the welding line together, side by side. So there's what we call a microculture within your and you don't have to do gap M or whatever to realize that there are different storms going on. So, so note taking item number one that you already hit on is we are all grieving something. This COVID yeah. thing is a thief and it has stolen. It has stolen a graduation. It has stolen a loved one. It has stolen an opportunity. Things that you'll never get back. Things that you can't go redo because time took it away and your chance passed. You know, we all have hearts breaking for one reason or another. But my heartbreaking because my kid didn't get to experience his senior year of high school track is different than somebody else's heartbreaking because they lost their spouse, right? Absolutely. Two different storms. Both th Now, the next thing to take a note on from that cultural assessment globally in teams is there's no real right or wrong in this. In other words, just because I'm in a rain shower and you're in a hurricane, I shouldn't be looking down my nose at you like, why is your world such a mess? Why are you coming to work late? I don't get why you can't homeschool your kids and get on the Zoom call. Like, I shouldn't be looking down my nose at your hurricane going, I'm fine. I'm in a shower. Why is this a problem for you, Nicole? And Nicole should not be looking back at me if she's in a hurricane going, oh my gosh, you're just in a little shower. That's ridiculous. I don't, you, you need to step in and help out everyone else. Like, no, if I'm in a shower, that's my reality and it's not right or wrong, it's what it is. And if you're in a hurricane or somewhere in between, that's your reality. So step one, everyone's in potentially different storm. Step two, no storm is wrong. Whatever your storm is your storm to deal with. And I as a leader, if I'm good, good cultures have great leadership that recognize those two things are going on. Now, what do they do about it is your question. So for step one, what they do about it is they have a healthy accurate analysis of the culture, whether it's measured through GAPM, because GAPM can show us specifics on storms and Absolutely, cause right. and effect. Yeah. And it can just dial you in. But first your awareness just has to be raised. Don't downplay it and don't overcook it, right? It's a storm. Everyone experiences it different. Don't, you know, we have a baseball team. My backyard neighbor is the, the, the head guy of the league. And he said, we have told all parents the choice is yours to play baseball this year, but don't judge anyone who makes a different choice. In other words, if your kids don't feel comfortable, your family doesn't feel comfortable, you're opting out this year, don't judge them for it. But also if you're opting out, don't judge these kids over here who want to go play. Oh, you should be, you shouldn't be playing baseball. Like don't, just everybody's answer is right. So that's the first step is to say, here's the reality. There's different 
perspectives, what do we do about it? I could note taking three, four, and five, and you already hit it. I'm just going to synthesize it from what yeah. we see in culture leadership. You said the things you were doing as a leader, right? Having to maybe triage, having to pull back from the, you know, fun patrol and look at the business side. Okay. There's three things that I would give any leader as cultural leadership heroism in this scenario that they may or may not do regularly. This is all good stuff to do regularly, but in the time of a crisis, you dial it down to your, you know, triage. One, be vulnerable. You don't have all the answers. You don't know how the FRCA works yet. The, the legislator doesn't, that you don't know how Peril Protection Act is going to work out. You don't, like, nobody knows. So just yeah. try, try to not come across as, oh my gosh, we're freaking out. We don't know what we're doing in Covenant, but also don't come across as, oh, we got this. We've been through it a hundred times, but nobody's been through it, right? Even so now, 120 days in, Ted, it feels like we're still at the beginning of, you know, the digital transformation and the beginning yeah. of what's to, yet to be revealed. And I think even just past the first honest reveal of people kind of checking themselves with that awareness to kind of start even beginning to look up and out. Yes. Um, and just I mean, like you said, honest. just like you said, I had to kind of you know, you didn't use the word vulnerable, but that's the word I'd write down is you had to say, I had to kind of admit that I need some help. And we, I'm sure our clients are in the same situation. They need to admit they need some help and we need to all be vulnerable. And, mm-hmm. and then the second thing you said was, and you did use this word, and it's the word I'd write down as my fourth note here is transparency. Mm-hmm. Share what's going on. What's the path out? What's the game plan? Where are you struggling financially, strategically, operationally? What are your customer sentiments? You know, this is a great time to have the voice of the customer, just like it's a great time to have the voice of the culture. Um, Don't not be transparent. Be transparent. If it's bad, it's bad. Call it bad. They can help solve it. Everyone needs to know what's going on. If it's good, it's good. Like some organizations, imagine if you're a um, medical PPE provider, your stock's going through the roof. You're as busy as you've ever been. This is going to be the best year of your life. You're hoping for more people to come in and do work. <laughs> you're hiring. You're, you can't get <laughs> right, you're yeah. Amazon. If you're Walmart, you're hiring. You know, the grocery stores are hiring. You're going to have the best year of your life. You're charging the highest prices you've ever been able to charge and people, and it's, and it's flying off the shelves. Well, that's going to be very different than, um, or, or, or like one of my clients is a wholesale distributor of beer right? And wine and spirits, right? So interestingly enough, in stressful times, beer sales go through the roof. (laughs) Everybody wants to have a drink. So they're having a record banner year. They're going to buy another company because of what's already, their financials look great, but they should be transparent. They still have to have the culture conversation though, because then they're challenged with a lot of people being typecast or judgmental, like you're saying, about the fact that well, how are you treating your employees? I mean, Amazon was one of the first companies to hit the paper headlines, right? So even if there's companies that are profiting or growing right now, there's still a lot to be revealed in terms of what that outcome is. And I think nothing happens without people. You and I both know that. I just right. think the good news about just this right now, even us talking about this, was the fact that the culture conversation is finally at the forefront of That's every true. business. And interestingly enough, something where safety was always this like business necessity, something to have to do, you know, OSHA compliance, blah, blah, blah. Unless you're like really in an industry that's regulated strongly by that. Um, A lot of industry would have safety kind of at the bottom of their HR tactics list. And all of a sudden now it's like at the forefront, but more than just safety, I feel like it's um, the heart, like the care, the true care for somebody's health um, and well-being. And so that's an interesting thing, whether they're busy or not, the conversation's real and it's at the forefront. So I think, you know, what are some of the things you're seeing um, out there as the culture halves, like the companies that are, are doing it right right now? Um, something for me, I felt, were the people that are really um, giving people and teams the resources to actually facilitate crucial conversations or the training so that they actually are um, given some guidance on what's expected or that it's okay to spend time, extra time on phone calls, for example, or meetings, really being with each other and talking to support one another. Um, I think some of those kind of proactive things or even companies that I'm working with that are hosting, um, you know, leadership development right now and are still investing in 
um, I call them remote working exchange meetings and remote working using assessments for cognitive remote one to ones. Because like you said, a third of the people are at Disneyland, a third of them are like bound to be depressed and lonely and they probably already are but haven't told you. And then there's only the other third of the population that really is these people who can like, yeah, I could be remote for a while and yeah, I could come in and either way, that's cool. You know, so when you look at that, what are you seeing right now with the things that have impressed you with in the marketplace, be it a headline or the paper with what you're seeing that you say, yeah, those were companies that get it. Those are companies that have the culture hat. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's how they're navigating a lot of those, you know, significant concerns, like how they're navigating the balance of safety with the need that the safest thing would be to just have everyone stay home, not come to work. But of course, they all then want a paycheck, which means we all got to not still make money. So how do you balance the financial? And like I said before, be transparent, whether you're making bank and how do you keep people safe? Has to, what safety should be transparent, what you're doing, what you're not, what you're looking at to make these decisions. So transparency, vulnerability, yeah. But then as far as, as what we're seeing, um, so productivity wise is an interesting thing. And Zoom oh, yeah. and factors I think that into can this. Be either way with the remote, some companies are realizing for the first time people are hitting targets and they're more productive than ever before. And other clients are really gonna find that they're, they're skilled talent they shouldn't get too comfortable. A lot of them are already starting to emotionally bridge to out of that organization. Even if they did do quote unquote, everything that was right for the CDC, they're going to find some people's heart have already just left because it was done to on auto and not with that extra vulnerability, transparency and explanation and support. And I've talked to some talent already that has completely already just reanalyzed their life situation and they're, right. they're going to go into a whole new field now. And, you know, some of the framework of unemployment has supported that transition for their families. Um, so I think not a single business should be comfortable right now, despite unemployment rates. No, I think, you know, overall, the, the organizations that have experienced uh, uptick in productivity on this remote working scenario have done it for jobs that are very, um, linear in terms of its deliverable so like widgets per hour so if i know what you're supposed to get done in a day let's say medical transcriptions you're supposed to get 50 an hour done 500 every 10 hours those people getting away from the distractions of the office and just heads down on it and plus i as a supervisor manager or a company i know if you're getting productive or not because it's widgets per hour it's a very defined those you know computer programmers who need to do X amount of code or whatever, they're more productive at home. They're introverts anyway, a lot of times, stereotypically. So there's certain jobs where productivity is spiking, it's getting better with the work from home, the remote work. So we'll have to see how that transitions into the future of the culture. And yeah, I'm curious how it plays out into burnout, how long it's sustainable, all these factors that are really key. Um, some people well, went home and yeah, if you're a workaholic or you're somebody who loves your work, you just dive in and you hunker down. But that's not necessarily long-term sustainability. And even if somebody's saying that they enjoy that and they're good with it, the honest truth is, is it's not sustainable. So well, there's something that has to be said for that. And, and you, you hit the nail on the head again. A lot of times the people that really do have an uptick or thrive in a remote work, remote, you know, work from home scenario in general, because this isn't new, work from home, telecommuting, you know, back when there were telephones, right, has been looked at several times. The people who do do a good job are either in that linear type job that's easy to measure productivity and are very self-disciplined. Mm -hmm. So they are the type that go home and just jump into it. They don't need a boss looking over their shoulder. They're self-starters. But that's a personality thing. Not everybody's that way, okay? And so if you combine that, what we're finding is I've already made the point that 20% of the people, let's say, are going to have an uptick in this remote work scenario. Mm -hmm. The 80-20 part of that is 80% of the people we're finding are seeing a decrease in their productivity. So they're working eight hours. They're getting about um, six hours of productivity in that eight, eight hours, but they're spending about two hours of what they would have otherwise had in the office of productivity, trying to figure out how to get those six hours done. So like you said, now where I used to just look over a cube and talk to my cube mate, I now got to figure out how to craft that email. Nicole's like, I'm a people person. I just want to go have a fun conversation. But now I got to somehow pour out the same emotion into an email. I'm not good at that. It's not my MO. And so they're, or, or they don't even know how to use the technology. And so they're, they're hung up on like me trying to log in today. I've used Zoom <laughs> for years 
And for some reason, all of a sudden today, the application decides not to launch because something in my window's updated or whatever. And it's like, okay, so now I've got to spend a half hour trying to figure out how to use the technology to do a Zoom call that if I was just there in person right. would be a productive half hour. Now it's two hours a day getting to be able to be productive with the other six hours through technology, remote work. And so here's what I predict will happen. There will be three waves. Wave one in our culture will be, hey, this uh, work from home thing worked really well during COVID, let's just do this all the time. Lots of people would love to have work from home arrangements, so they'd be a push, wave one. And lots of companies will consider it. They'll be like, hey, this, this did have some positives and you don't have to commute 30 minutes in the snow if you work from home and you, you know, Wave two will be an evaluation of what happened in wave one. Oh, it, sure. sounded we'll good on yeah. paper. it sounded good on paper, but only we're paying the same amount of money, but we're getting six hours of productivity instead of eight. Now we got to hire more people and then that breaks the budget. And so the business evaluation of wave one will be wave two. Is it right for every position or all the positions we did it for? Is it sustainable? Like you said, or is it leading to burnout or other problems? Can we afford it? Can we, you know, people, even though they're six hours productive, right? Even though they're, they're only like 70% as productive, generally, they're not probably likely to be willing to take 70% of their prior pay when they were in the office. So if we try to tell them we need to reconcile the financial side, they're not going to like it. The evaluation isn't going to go over well. They want to work at home, make the same amount of money, but also have the freedom, autonomy, flex to only do six hours. So that won't work. And then wave three will be the unfortunate retraction of wave one. We will be calling people back into the office that we previously told could have a work from home arrangement. Now look, you can go look at Best Buy and see this 10 years ago. They decided to do a work from home thing. They have lots of technology and professionals. Right. They launched it all out. They said, hey, we're gonna close offices in uh, Minneapolis. We're gonna save on leases and, uh, and just office hotel people when they need to be in the office. And they did it for a couple of years and then they experienced this, holy cow, we are not getting very good productivity from these work from home arrangements. And then they had to do what was worse, worse than evaluating it up front is to do a takeaway, right? You give somebody a benefit like work from home or eye care, you know, vision right. care. And then two years later say, oh, sorry, we're gonna have to take that vision care back. Or we're gonna have to take your flexible work plan or your work from home arrangement back Tell your dog it's going to have to walk itself. Tell your kids they're going to have to get themselves to school. Tell the soccer you can't coach. All that stuff you could do when you had flex work from home. We're taking the benefit away, which imagine what that will do to morale and culture, let's say two years from now when wave three hits. So I think the smart money and the real haves is that they are not just going to react to this whole new normal and let's do work from home. Zoom call seems to work for now. This is a give a new meaning to the, it's better than nothing. This is a better than nothing scenario, not an optimal scenario. And the new normal has to be, can't be a better than nothing. And so your culture has to plan ahead of time. Don't just go creating work from home agreements with everybody, right? Really evaluate position by position and almost even person by person. Is this a self-starter? They, they don't sit around saying, tell me what to do. They go find what to do. They're right. a, well, if they're at home, then they're gonna go give you eight hours of work. But if they're the type of person that's like, I just do what I'm told. Like, tell me what my next move is. Otherwise, I love I'll that you said it's by person by person because that's exactly what it is now. And what whether we come back or whether we're in the field or not, people need to start um, leaders, operational leaders who have managed the people kind of in their job title, so to speak. These people, all of a sudden, um, as much as it's going to be about that we, it, it it immediately has gone to the me. And the question is, is have they defined? how leadership lives within their business. What is leadership within this business, which is part of our culture initiatives. But if they haven't defined a common language for leadership, wherever you stand, well, then all of a sudden we have people that don't know how to lead individuals and create the we of the team simultaneously. Exactly. And that I think is going to be the biggest challenge for operational leaders. You know, that agility that we talk about, um, whether it be generational agility or leadership agility or the ability to actually just shift gears for the people that you're managing individually, but within that umbrella of the company and how we define leadership. And I think that's something that's kind of an opportunity right now. What are some of the things you see right now of like companies that are definitely have not? So, I mean, right now you're kind of talking about a have not. It's literally better than nothing is a have not. Don't get stuck in the better than nothing, you know, approach. 
um, in your business. Get back to how do we how do we get a high performance environment? How do we get people engaged and excited? How do we pivot? Um, all of that to me is really what you're talking about. There is kind of this don't do that. <laughs> That's a have not scenario. I feel like of just coast and hope to survive and stay in that survival versus thrive mentality and. You know, I don't know that that's the way to do it, to get people to stay with you and believe in your company and retain talent. No, it's, it, it's, um, so remember I said that two hours of lack of productivity, right? Some of that's figuring out how to get those six hours productive, but some of that's just, it's time available that you could have used it if you were in the office or had the file right there or whatever, that now is just free. So the question is, what are you doing with that time? That's freed up time, maybe an hour a day, five hours a week. Yeah. Okay. So 5, 10, 15, 20 hours a month per person times 100 people in the company. It's a lot of hours kind of freed up. What are you going to do with it? Well, you could go for a walk because you're home and no one will see you. Or you could, if you're a leader, like you just said, you could figure out how to get your people doing some professional development so they come out of this with more skills, knowledge, cross-training or whatever than they went in. The have-nots are looking at this as a reactive cost cutting approach, meaning, well, uh, you know, we're not, we're not making as much money. Our market's suffering. Um, we're going to have to lay people off. We're going to, well, then what does that do to the people you got left? Well, your superstars now go, Oh geez, now I get to do twice the work because I just lost two people. Yeah. I was you already carrying a business plan for yeah. talent. So-and-so wants to stay home and uh, now I got to do that. And we lay people off and we're losing customers. So now you're superstars to your point, because you're not putting a proactive effort in developing and coming out of this curve stronger than you went in. You're being reactive. You're looking at it like I need to cut costs, kind of like thinking you can save your way to retirement, right? You can't just saving, saving, saving. You got to invest. Sure. Well, you could cut costs all you want. You could cut staff, cut salary, cut costs, right? But if you don't invest in leadership, if you don't show a path out of this corner where we're going into, okay? If you don't show a way out and you're cutting costs and losing customers and struggling and you're in the have not category, and then you're not going to invest in your culture or developing people and doing the culture stuff that you do at HR Boost. Now we invoke Nicole's book, The Talent Emergency. Right. Now the two superstars you do have are getting nervous. And like you said, what are they doing with their hour? They're updating their resume. They're looking for. Oh, they're already on the phone, Ted. Like I've had calls. Out of this. I've had calls just in the last few weeks from really skilled, high-level people um, in different areas that are. They may be at work in, in an environment where they're on site right now, um, but they've witnessed what leadership did in this situation, and they are already on the phone, Ted. There is people right now who are courting their next employer because they've already done the most dangerous thing in any relationship, right? Which is, I don't care anymore. I'm not so here there's, anymore. There's you people that me, I'll leave. sit here for a little while, but I'm on my way out. They have one foot out the door. And I think there's a lot of skilled talent that's already there. It's going to be, a, I, I think we're going to witness talent transfer, significant talent transfer um, in that second wave. And that's going to be something that's really interesting to me is the companies that are going to capitalize on talent transfer, even in the best and brightest circles right now. Um, and it came out of, you know, just regional con conversations that I'm having that are kind of national boards or just calls that I'm on. There is already a lot of shift of people being able to open up their talent pool. And for the companies and the people that wanted that telecommute and have liked it, but then realized they're in an environment where they're going to have to go back and there's not a good answer for that yet, they're going to go ahead and jump ship. Um, and, and really it's where they could even jump ship out of state. And you thought you were competing for talent before. Well, hello. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly right. And like you just said, there's people who quit and leave. And then there's people who quit and stay. And those are dangerous because they're one foot out the door, like you said, but they're masquerading as if they're still, you know, they're still collecting a check. Right. What are they using their check. time for? <laughs> yep. And, and so the have nots, if you think of it like uh, there's a, there's a, kind of an analogy that I use about driving a car around a corner, especially if you were in a race, like a NASCAR race, right? The straightaway, it's full on the gas. Whoever's got the fastest car wins the straight, but the, the race is one in the corners because that's where the strategy, the driving technique, the all comes together. And when you go into the corner, you can't keep your foot on the gas or you'll wreck. 
okay? So going into the pandemic, into the corner, you have to break. You have to cut costs or cut back or Nicole has to put on her CEO, you know, the, the I am the boss hat instead or of the pause I'm the and get top of mind, as Dr. Bill Crawford says, pause and get yeah. top of mind, right? Nicole, Nicole has to start working with the bank to look at what, you know, kind of federal programs can help sustain my business. That's not something she does normally. That's not what she, she's hit. She's pumping the brakes into this curve. It's unknown. How are we going to deal with it? It's, it's threatening. But you go into the curve cutting your costs or, or cutting back or furloughing or whatever, and the have nots are going to stay in that mentality. We have to, you know, keep cutting and we're losing customers. And then your talent is going to jettison your good talent. Now you're left with B, C, or if you're lucky, B, you know, C and D players. You think that's going to help you come out of the corner? You didn't right. invest in keeping your A players. You think your C and D players are going to now out compete your competitors? No way. You're, you're, you just set yourself up for failure in your culture coming out of the corner. Okay. Break going in. We all had to do that. Take stock of the suit. Is this the zombie apocalypse? Are we all going to die? We had to step back. Look at that. Okay. Well, now we're four months in and you alluded to this earlier. The have nots are going to stay in that mentality of hitting the brakes, pumping the brakes, being basically not investing, cutting costs instead of investment return on investment thinking. The haves are saying, the way you come out of the corner ahead is you get on the gas earlier. So at the apex of the corner, not when you're all the way out and it's clear sailing on the straightaway, a NASCAR driver will tell you the decision to get on the gas sooner in the corner allows you to come out of the corner faster than your two opponents who waited longer. And now you overtake them on the next straight. And then it's now it's all about the next corner. Who wins the next corner? Well, this pandemic is just like a corner. And if you're, if you're have nots in culture, aren't paying attention to culture, aren't paying attention to talent, aren't investing in leadership, fine for the first two months. We got to take stock and be real. We're losing money. We're losing customers. Let's stop the bleeding triage, right? Right. But now the bleeding stopped. And now you got to figure out what are you going to do to get on the gas? How are you investing? Because your talent that's thinking of jettisoning out of the organization is looking for the plan is looking for how you're going to come out of this stronger than you went in, is looking for how you're going to invest in and protect and grow and build your culture, talent, and leadership. And well, they're, they're goes, looking no real for permanent change goes and happens without a plan. And we believe in strategic culture plans, you and I, but it's, I think what's really interesting, I love this analogy that you're putting forth. It, it's, it's great. So great. We have a car. We have a race car, for heaven's sakes. It's coming around the bend. Well, we all know what goes into a race car to make it work, and it's certainly not just the driver. So when you think about that, creating the new and the pivot and everything going forward, a lot of leaders put that pressure on themselves. And I think there's a huge opportunity now, and I'll lead us to our third kind of question, which is what is this wonderful opportunity right now for all these leaders who never really took our calls before or even cared about culture or didn't really think it was the emergency? What is that real opportunity for them right now with their teams when they think of putting what they need to into their race car to get it to turn the corner? I mean, yeah. that to me is the richest opportunity right now. And that's what's exciting to me is that really a lot of people could get out there and have these conversations, crucial conversations, and ask for some inputs from their teams about what was good. What do you like? What do we miss? How can we make it better? And even that exchange of conversation can lead to the richest plan possible. Um, and really, if people have their handprint on anything, you and I both know that their handprint's on it. You're right here. You're not just here. And I think that's the biggest opportunity from my perspective is companies that are going to really take that opportunity, you know, to the bank with them in terms of that, that ROI. Yeah. So to, to make that tangible, and I think you're right on the money. It's, it's, what are you going to do with this opportunity? You, you've only kind of been, you can either look at it like I need to curl up in a ball and pump the brakes and crawl in a hole and take shelter. Or you can look at it as I needed to do that to make sure I was safe in this corner. But now what is my opportunity to think differently? It's almost like I've been given a gift. I've been given a gift to step back. I don't know how many times I hear people say, we don't have time to do professional development. We don't have time to do a strategic plan. We're too busy. We're too busy. Well, guess what? You just got five hours a week freed up because you can't do all the normal stuff. So now you've been given this gift of time, a gift of step back, a gift of perspective. How are you going to use that time? What are you going to do to transition it? So tangible example, one strategic planning client of ours that's got a culture strat plan and an operational strat plan that we did 
is an architectural firm, okay? And I work with lots of different architects and architectural and engineering firms, so I get their industry. But one of the things we did was we stepped back and said, how is this change from the pandemic? How, when we went into the corner, what's going what's gonna to be the outcome on our market coming out of the corner? Well, one of the things that we're projecting in our strategic, they took the time to do this. They got their high performers involved to say, let's first be vulnerable, transparent, and acknowledge the risk of this threat. And the risk was there's going to be a lot of people who go to online and don't finish that office remodel or heaven forbid, they're not going to build a new building if they're going to have people working from home. Okay. So commercial architectural projects probably needs to be changed in its forecast and it's a bad change. So your superstars are going, oh, look, my leadership team is reevaluating the impact, at least for the next few years of the pandemic on our strategic plan. And we got their input. We got the high performing architects input and said, we, we know that commercial architecture is likely to go down. We want your handprint on this. Like, what should we do instead? Well, what they did is they came up with institutional architecture. So a university who's building a new stadium addition, okay, for their, for their okay. Um, athletic arena, okay, that's all raised through boosters, board of regents budgets, fundraising, right? It's already in the bank. The budget is raised. It has nothing to do with the economy. It's already been given. It's already in the bank. It's just now a matter of them executing the build, which usually takes years. So the point would be, let's not go find more commercial clients in the next year with business development. Let's go find more institutional, a school system. Their budget That's is through pivot. taxes. And I love these inspirational pivots that you know, you're witnessing. I'm witnessing certain pivots as well. But it definitely happens, I think, from that we conversation internally, getting everybody's ideas kind of going. Um, and that's a real opportunity if people can make that happen. And it doesn't so have to be in-house. It can be done with everybody in a context like this. There's great platforms for that. But so you they figured out that taxes aren't gonna change. Pandemic isn't gonna change taxes in school systems. School systems need to renovate a gym or build a new gym. They need an architect and an engineer, right? So let's go after those institutions that have fixed budgets that are not affected by the pandemic instead of commercial operations who may not be leasing space, or right? And because to your point, we did this with the culture, not to it. We did it with them. We got them involved. Those senior architects that are the high talent that might be leaving if they don't see a plan or like how their leadership's handling this or aren't given a voice. Sure. Now, because they helped us determine the next steps, they have confidence in the future, confidence in the revenue, confidence they'll have a job, confidence they won't be laid off. And guess what? Now, some of their friends that are high performers at other architectural firms are asking their bosses, what's our plan out of the corner? And their bosses haven't done that. They're the have-nots. They're sheltering in place, literally and figuratively, like their head is. And they don't have answers. So guess what? the two best architects at firm B, the have nots, are likely to move over to the firm that gives them a voice and has a plan and accelerates out of the corner. And that's gonna leave firm B in a big lurch because they're gonna lose two of their best talented architects that are now moving over to firm A because firm A had a plan, listen to the voice of their people, right? Listen to the well, culture, that's value the their culture. That's the game. That is the game right now, which is if people are realizing that their communication strategy um, has to be really strong internally and lived and then embraced in such a way that that brand, as they call it, can exist. And the bottom line is, is that at all times we're, we're we've been communicating external and still trying to make that, you know, employee value proposition tangible in that unique selling proposition. But I think what's really cool is that right now you could put some serious investment in your employee value proposition. And if you do a really good job of investing in your employee value proposition right now, your USP going forward, golden. I mean, that's, that's the difference. That's the difference between the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots are going to look at, well, what would it cost me to invest or take advantage of an opportunity? The haves are going to say, what would it make me and what would it cost me not to? Yes, totally and different. it's going to help them. It's going to yep. help them recruit beyond 2020. <laughs> right. Because eventually, if they're around, they're going to need to recruit beyond 2020 because the talent emergency of gap of skilled talent is still there. And I think what's interesting, too, is a lot of conversations that I've heard, too, out there, Ted, where people who were like, well, how do we get this person to work at home? Or the dynamics of where, you know, they're saying older workers could be at risk or whatever it might be. And they're getting into the weeds on 
people's risk scenarios or their self-perceived risks against COVID. And I think it's dangerous conversation. I think it's much better to open up what I'm kind of calling elective employee engagement, which is we have this work available. These are the jobs that we need for on-site. These are the jobs that we have in the field. Here's some special projects that we have over here that we need some good skill talent on, maybe building your um, training programs, maybe how-to videos, maybe creating a learned library, whatever it might be. And so you put all these out there and then what if you just created this hybrid approach where you let employees pick where, what, which bucket's best suited for them um, and let them pick their destiny within your organization. And I think that's an opportunity that exists still right now too. It's like this elective employee engagement where people sometimes, I've seen some companies in Chicago just asking for people to volunteer to come on site first versus being told you need to be here. Um, and that's being much more warmly received. And the people that are the butterflies that really do want to get back and miss the office or miss the, the work routine, if you will, um, they'll show up. So it's, it's there's, there's a balance between the two worlds right now, but I think the culture opportunity is really rich right now. And I think it, it's surprising just some people right now who are just doing the automatic response like this, even some of the biggest companies we know, oh, we'll just be remote into next year. No biggie. And, and what's sad is two thirds of the population doesn't, isn't going to do well in that just by psychological cognitive proof right. of scalpels. You know, a third of them are like, yeah, I'm a Disneyland. Right. Two thirds of them are like, oh my gosh. Right. This is, you know, and they may, they may have realized it already. They're dying and they're going out of their mind in their house. Or um, there's people that are going to come into it within the next, you know, second wave, so do we say. They're going to come into that realization that this isn't working for me. I mean, and, and not only that, if you are going to have the work from home scenario long term, you know, if it isn't just a sprint, but it's something that you're trying to, you know, set up as part of your new cultural normal. Yeah. Some of the really wise leaders, you know, that I see, you know, we've all heard about the virtual cocktail party or end of the day meeting or, you know, yeah, let's make sure we all get a Zoom call all staff or all team meeting. All that stuff's, I think, smart, good, needs to continue to build the teamwork. I but, agree. But I also think you have to create opportunities for what would naturally occur in the office where somebody has a question, needs some mentorship, whatever. They don't want to necessarily set up, call their boss. They know Nicole's busy, so I don't want to put her on a meeting on her schedule. I, you know, so I just won't ask the question. Normally, she's right here. I can ask her when she runs by or I can just knock on her door. Nicole, I got a question. That, that naturally occurring cultural uh, dynamic is not happening. So here's an interesting thing. Organiz I've seen and, and I learned from some good leaders and then started counseling some of our clients to do this. You know how in college your professors had office hours? Like I have classes here, here, and here. I have research going on. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays from one to three, I'm in the office. You don't need to meet, uh, schedule a meeting. Just show up, sit at a chair outside. If I got somebody, if I don't, I'll talk to you for 20 minutes. If you need help on a test or whatever, you need to drop my class. Like I have office hours, one to three Tuesdays and Thursdays. You can count on me being here and available. If nobody needs me, I'll be doing research or whatever. Zoom calls where the Nicole, the leader of the team, the CEO in your case, says, I'm going to on Tuesdays and Thursdays from noon to one, turn on a Zoom and just eat lunch or do my work and my Zoom's open. And here's the link. If you need to jump on and ask me, or if you have a question, maybe there'll be two or three of you on it at the same time, but I am open to office hours so that we can keep this dynamic where I'm, pa it's the, I'm passing you in the hallway, but now you know when it's available. That way you don't have to feel dumb or like you're taking more time out of the, you know, when we do these Zoom calls and we have 50 boxes, you know, and you're like, I don't right. want to say something because there's 49 other people here. Well, how are you going to maintain that dynamic in the culture where Nicole's accessible, where she's you know, available, I can ask her a mentorship question or cover down on something. Well, I'll just pop into her, you know, noon to one open Zoom, say, hey, Nicole, I got a quick question, five minute conversation, I'm out, but you leave yours open because maybe somebody else will log in, maybe they won't, but you're available. I think that's good and it's a, it's a good practice for sure. And I'm somebody who lives my life that way already where my calendar is open to all the people that work for me. So they can see where I'm at, and what I'm doing, and they can auto book with me and all of that. But I've, I've learned in my own experience too, that sometimes people still don't come to maybe your open window. And um, I've done something unique in the last 120 days, which was a different kind of survey, just asking people their well-being and really, are you having trouble with focusing your resilience, you know, happiness, 
motivation. Yeah. How are you just feeling? Honestly, it could have yeah. nothing to do with work. It could just be, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, and I needed to take that kind of heart reading off of my own team because they're caregivers, I feel like. HR people yeah. really are caregivers. To other Absolutely. people who are going, you know, a lot of the community we serve, they've been in, in HR triage and serving those people. And so I think sometimes for me, it was where I was really proactive and I, book, I reached out and booked those one-on-ones with them. And then I even made sure that they came and knew that I was present with them. And some of them came really prepared and ready and other people were just happy to see you. And it, even if we didn't have a real agenda, it was great to have that hour conversation and just learn them and see how they're doing and feel that. Um, and I think that it, it can be very much um, a good practice for, for leaders who want to be intentional. But we, we typically recommend that as a normal approach, right? We call it safe and proactive feedback channels. And it's the proactive in it that I'm not waiting for them to reach out to me. I'm creating an outreach to them so that we have, um, right now I have some mixed emotions, mixed feedback about it, just from the standpoint of, I, as to your point, I think it's always a good idea. It's a good mm-hmm. management style to be accessible, right? Um, but because of the technology, work from home, Zoom call fatigue thing we got going on. Mm-hmm. I fear that there, there are some people who are going to be like, oh, I would love Nicole to reach out to me. I would love Ted to reach out to me. Like, I would love to have that. I've come prepared or not, whatever. But, I, you know, we could have a heart to heart, share human life a little. You know, I'm glad she's, she's not waiting for me to have a problem. She's reaching out to talk proactively. Right. I think a lot of people would love that. But I also think there's a sector of our team right now that legitimately is fatigued zoomed oh, out yeah. so to say i want one sure. more zoom call with them i'd rather you just open your noon to one office hours and i'll call you for five minutes versus i have to put a 45 minute shop talk with nicole on here oh right. man you know so i kind of have some well you don't have to do it zoom i'm zoomed out personally i actually thank people who just get on the phone with me these days yeah like people who just want to talk on the phone and don't want to do the video Zoom thing because it just sucks so much life out of you, um, especially if you right. have a few in a day. Um, well, and you have to sh- shave and shower and whatever for a Zoom yeah. call. So, you know, if you just do it on the phone, you, but, but also, um, funny thing, yesterday I was in a meeting. So, I mean, kind of to your point of what are you comfortable with, right? Maybe mm-hmm. the human interaction could still happen, like, but you don't make it mandatory. You say, if you're comfortable, nobody's in the office. We can come into the office. I'll wear a mask. You wear a mask, whatever you want. We'll sit 12 feet apart. But at least we could we could meet, be human in person. If they're not comfortable, do a, a phone or whatever. But I had a meeting with a team yesterday, and I asked them. I said, "Are you guys comfortable meeting at your office?" Which I know is not being used right now. So the conference is vacant. Everything's been blue lighted and cleaned. I said, "Or would you rather do another Zoom or whatever?" They're all, so we we did it in person with masks, you know, fifteen feet apart. And it was so great to see everyone in person or whatever. I and love what? hearing that. I think for me, it's happening, like my first in-person like group meeting, so to speak, is with my Vistage group. And it's this yeah. week. Um, People are craving it to the point yeah. where one of the guys on the team, as he was walking us from the elevator, which is now locked, right? So he had to escort us up. Uh, as he was walking us from the elevator to the conference room, I said, wow, uh, this place looks pretty dark and dim and whatever. And, and he said, yeah, we've been working from home since March, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he said, I was so excited to get to come into the office and come to work today. It's like a vacation. <laughs> yeah, from their house. Like, no yeah, joke. Especially especially coming to school. work yeah. can be a vacation. So you talk about happiness and well-being. This guy's saying coming to work today was like a vacation. I was excited. Okay, well, we need to start looking at, do we need another Zoom call or do we need to be in person? Or that's what the haves are doing as they're, they're flexing it out. Like you said, don't mandate people come in if they have in a high risk category, feel unsafe. But at the same time, don't mandate they not come in if they could get stuff done and do it safely. So we're coming out of the curve. We're not in the zombie apocalypse triage stage. Some organizations are figuring that out. The haves are getting real with their culture and microculture. Well, they're and the have not. For people like that person who's excited to go back into work and like taking vacation from home. They're creating parent infinity groups, communities within these new topics that we're dealing with. Yes. Anxiety, lack of focus, having a problem with my fitness, my health, you know. Right. And then these parents are about ready to like pull their hair out because Uh-oh. the four year old screaming across the hall and they're trying to conduct work and focus. Um, there's special 
community within each of those subtopics. And if businesses can create the we within those subtopics, they're going to be helping their um, workforce with creating some support and affinity, you know, groups, so to speak, new topic areas within community um, that can be done virtually or otherwise. But I think we have to have the opportunity to build, see somebody with the we, the I, the dignity, right? I see you, I feel you, I hear you. Yes. And then, and then get into, now let's get back to us and find the we within that. And if you can sustain that authentically right now, you will come out on the other side. Your business will, your team will. Um, and I just, you know, Ted, I appreciate you having the conversation with me today. And I just think, think seeing what's going on even in a different state with you is kind of fun. And just for transparency for everybody. So Ted and I do business back and forth all year round, right, Ted? Right. Okay. And we're, we're processing culture data for our clients and our teams. And um, how often do we do a face-to-face -face Zoom meeting, Ted? How many times do we do a face-to-face -face Zoom meeting? This is the first this one. Is <laughs> this is it, guys. And so that just goes to show when you have connection, and Ted and I have connection, we don't have to do this. We don't need yeah. this. We don't need this video. And that's another temperature reading on your relationships. But, if but you, I think that to your point, the human in it is the reason that we don't have to do this in right. a face-to-face -face call, we are always good at sharing communication and emails back and forth prompt right we've done enough face to face to invest in the foundation of the relationship there's tremendous trust and respect if you push or i push we're right. looking at each other's perspectives before we have to go back and forth so i think that again that just translates the same way to a team if you as a leader are investing all that same stuff that you and i have nicole in our relationship when it comes time for crunch time right right you don't necessarily need to start building it in person or face to face or live. You can do it over a phone call or you can do it on an email or a text. So it just goes to I mean, show some companies will hear what you just said and they know they got what a head start. Right. They can yeah. accelerate out of the curve. That's right. They can yep. absolutely turn this curve. Yep. So that's no exciting. For them. Yep. But thank yep. you so much, Ted. Tell everybody how they can find you if they want to find you. Yeah. So, you know, PSCultureMatters.com is the best way to get a hold of us. And, you know, just there's information on the stuff we talked about today. But uh, again, I don't think that you have to exactly use our tools, process, or approach. I just hope you start wherever you're at and then Absolutely. keep moving forward from there. Absolutely. You know, that'll make, our mission is to make Mondays better. And if, if leaders hear this stuff and they can do one or two of the things we talked about today, all of a sudden that team's Mondays got better. And that's one more company that you and I just helped to make their Mondays better. Amen. Amen. Sometimes yeah. it's not your own oxygen mask first. And so right. you got your own oxygen mask, but it's good. Seeing you, it's good seeing you, Ted. And I appreciate you, you taking the time and I'll see you again sometime soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks for having everybody. me. Nicole. Have a great yep. day.